biggest ideas. We're all used to gross national product, gross domestic product. Well, our next speaker is interested in SWB, social welfare beings. Dr. John Hallowell. John's making an effort to introduce these rather more emotional calculations into the dry science of economics. Do I have it right? You have it. Okay. And before I leave the stage, I actually have a question for you. Sure. If you want to introduce happiness into the equation, do you also introduce the opposite? When forced. All right. <laughs> Are you happy? If you happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it and you really want to show it and you want to have lunch soon, clap your hands. <laughs> this program that uh, CIFAR has with great courage put together is trying to put the social back in social science and to put human beings back into economics where they fell out about uh, 100 years ago. Uh, so the assumption in economics has been that people are self-interested, rational calculators with full knowledge of the environment around them, and they do these rational calculations to maximize their own self-interest. Well, that's wrong in psychological terms in about five directions. The team that's been put together is of psychologists, sociologists, political scientists, and economists uh, trying to go back to uh, the fundamentals. Let's find out how people actually behave and then see what implications the behavior of real people has for the social sciences that differs from what we learn from looking at other things. There are three strands of this uh, that I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about today. The question I was asking you at the beginning and you answered so happily is in fact the question we ask of people all over the world in a slightly more formal way and treat the answer seriously. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how satisfied are you with your life these days? Now this question is being asked, and as, we are, as I speak, this question is being asked to a sample, in a sample of 130 countries by Gallup. They have taken this seriously enough. They're now regularly monitoring the state of uh, well-being in the world, and we're starting to analyze these data and taking them seriously. There are a lot of people who are skeptical about this. It turns out that the way you answer a question like that will depend on what you've had for lunch. I have a graduate student who uh, got all these data from the survey together and then went back, because we know the postal code of where all these people live, went back and found out what the weather was like on the day that question was asked. Uh, to that person, they found on the 10-point scale, if there were more than two millimeters of rain that day, you answered 0 0.25 lower on a 10-point scale. And this was for your life satisfaction. When I first started research on this, and not a long time ago, less than 10 years ago, I took a job as Aristotle's research assistant because he had not had a lot of good research help at that time, but he'd done some pretty fundamental stuff. So I went down Aristotle's list of propositions uh, of what makes a good life and um, decided to test them because at one important point he says, you know, these are, just, these are just theories. This is just my judgment about what makes... If they don't stand the test of the world, then they are just theory. If they're to be important, they must stand that test. So I said, okay, I, Aristotle, can I be your research assistant? And he was quite specific, too, about the kind of questions to ask. He says, you ask someone to reflect on their life as a whole. You don't just ask them for their mood at the moment. You want to be engaged in a life with meaning. You, and of course, when we then went back to the data, we were trying to test all the aspects of these propositions. What are the characteristics of what makes a uh, good life? Well, the material counts. And one of the things that in this literature has made gee whiz, it makes headlines because people like to hear things in dollars. They shouldn't, but it gives them a kind of numeraire. So we know that people are satisfied with their lives if they have higher incomes. So we measure that effect in these very large samples, and it differs by country, and et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and then we measure how important other things are to their life satisfaction. We don't ask them, how much does money mean to you? Ask them these things. We just ask them how happy they are with their lives, and then we collect data for all the other things that are going on in their lives, indeed, like how much weather is, uh, how much rain is falling on them that day, and then we infer the effects of these other variables on their happiness. Well, the weather was 0 0.25. The money is non-trivial. If you move from the bottom to the top of the income distribution, it's worth about uh, 0 0.4 on a 10-point scale. So not nothing, and very significant. It's very significantly different from zero, but not the whole story, you might say. Well, is it the whole story? Someone who spends frequently time with family, friends, and neighbors, which are all independently important, will have a higher li life satisfaction than someone who doesn't by one point on a 10-point scale. So twice as much life satisfaction from these contacts uh, with family, friends, and neighbors, not all of them necessarily friendly, this is just time spent, but on average contributing enormously to uh, well-being, is uh, worth more in life satisfaction than moving from the very bottom to the very top. Uh, of the income distribution. So, hmm, if that's true, maybe we ought to be rethinking some of the ways in which we analyze how pol policies to affect society are designed and how they're delivered. It's likely, for example, that process is going to be just as important as product, and uh, institutions that are set up to increase income per capita may accidentally, through laws of unintended consequences, have had much bigger negative effects in terms of well-being on other aspects of people's lives. We also know how the life cycle of, uh, of life satisfaction, and it, for, at least for the Western countries, we're now out of these new Gallup data, starting to find this pattern is not so obvious in the poorer countries, but in all the industrial countries, there's kind of a U-shape, especially it's, it's a very marked you shape if you account for subjective health, whole subjective health constant, have this U shape, start out pretty happy, then you get through into that middle age period when uh, we assume it has something to do with the con conflicts of all sides coming in and you're just trying to manage them, then you get through that slough of despond, through Death Valley, and you're, <laughs> <laughs> and by the time you're my age, you're saying, this is a pretty nice game, and <laughs> And the point is, however much I'm enjoying it today, I'll enjoy it even more tomorrow. And of course, if you're just before that mid-40s uh, valley, all you have to say is, tomorrow is going to be maybe not as good as today, but just look ahead a few years, and it's going to be a lot better uh, than it was. And of course, there are a lot of strategies for uh, dealing with that. This is just mood, you say, just mood. I got that question when I'd become Aristotle's research assistant and talked about all these differences across uh, countries, and people would say, especially groups of economists who are big on something called revealed preference, you don't pay any attention to anything unless somebody's actually doing something. Then you infer their utility function by ex what kind of behavior they're actually doing. So all we're doing is ask them how happy are they. They, pff, they tell you anything, won't they? If they're so happy in Sweden as they are, why do they always commit suicide? So this went on for quite a long time, but I'd get this question, I said, damn, it's not good enough, I can't do it. So I took a couple of terms off and went back to Oxford and became Durkheim's research assistant. I always work for good people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, the nicest thing about being a research assistant to someone who's dead, they didn't get the chance not to hire you. <laughs> Uh, so it turns out Durkheim didn't need any research assistance. It was a brilliant piece of applied social science. He did more than a century ago studying suicide rates across communities and countries. And he did brilliantly at uh, explaining the causes. So we, we essentially replicated all of Durkheim's work on suicide. Of course, with an ulterior motive. I wanted to say, is it true that the subjective well-being data, which are easy to collect, we can get them by neighborhoods, and we can get them within firms, and we can get them all kinds of places very easily as adjuncts to simple surveys. If they tell a true message, this is going to be really important for finding out how life really is. So we fit the same model that we'd fitted to international differences in subjective well-being and fitted it to suicide rates across the same uh, country. It fit like a glove. All the same variables were in there, both models explaining some, about three-quarters of the variance across 
countries, or 60 or more or, uh, countries, and you can then say, there, <laughs> to the people who say they want revealed preference, you've got revealed preference. The suicide's kind of final act. The only differences were, and Sweden fitted both models perfectly, religion turns out to be more protective against suicide than it is productive of well-being, although it helps both. Suicide, Sweden is very low in, uh, in uh, belief in God. Divorce is even worse for suicide than it is for uh, life satisfaction, and uh, Sweden is very high on divorce rates. The quality of government is enormously important in explaining international differences in life satisfaction. Uh, but doesn't matter so much for suicide, so, and, and Sweden's very high on the quality of government. So that explains why the uh, same model fits with different coefficients. Sweden fits both models perfectly. Uh, Swedish uh, puzzle uh, is over. Moving up one point on a 10-point scale of trust in the workplace has the life satisfaction equivalent of a 40% change in income. This is a talk on SWB, which is subjective well-being. Uh, why do I get involved with suicide? I told you one way. But an economist, one of the other phenomena we're discovering, if I'd showed you this map of subjective well-being across neighborhoods in Toronto, there's no correlation with income per capita across those same neighborhoods. The strongest variable explaining it is the extent to which people think their neighbors can be trusted. That's important. And we're finding this in every realm of life. I've been studying social capital for five or six years, finding out that these community-level connections, pioneered by Bob Putnam, who was a member of our CIFAR group, uh, are enormously important in, in making things work better at the community level and for the individual. What about the half of one's wake life that's spent on the job? Surely the nature of the social environment there has got to be important. So in the next round of this big survey, we included questions about the job. And it turned out when we redid this in a big US survey as well, we discovered of all the factors, a lot of factors that explain differences across individuals in their subjective well-being, several measures of trust were top importance, trust in police, trust in neighbors and the extent to which management can be trusted in the place in which you work, and that was the biggest one of all. You can then figure out how much your income matters to you. You can figure out how much the trust in the workplace ma matters, and you get something called compensating differentials, right? In other words, how much different could your salary be to make you as happy working in a workplace of a differing level of trust? Well, we'll get this. Moving up one point, on a 10-point scale of trust in the workplace has the life satisfaction equivalent of a 40% change in income. Well, that can't be true, and we've got quite a lot of evidence that says it is true, it can't be true unless, A, people who work are inured to thinking that life is hell, many of them, those who work in low-trust workplaces, and just think that has to be part of the job, and on the employer's side, they simply don't get it. The people, if there are people within the firm who thinks that the way in which people think and work together is important for not just their life satisfaction but the firm, they get pushed away into the HR department to organize retirement parties. <laughs> and they worry why they can't get people to uh, fill uh, the important jobs. This is now changing. So we're now finding in the actual, uh, these, these research results on well-being in the workplace are being taken seriously. They're uh, at the community level, they're now starting to be uh, taken seriously. And Statistics Canada, bless its heart, is now starting to put these life satisfaction questions in all their major surveys. They're even a venture to get them into uh, uh, a, a labor force survey equivalent in the, in the US, so that we may eventually be able to do some of this science in a more effective way. There's a huge amount of experimental psychology that underlies uh, all of this. It turns out that humans systematically overestimate the satisfaction they're going to get in the future from material things, systematically underestimate the satisfaction they're going to get from uh, uh, human relations, and that's bad news. The good news is that people take advice. 
Now, the bad way of interpreting that is everything's context dependent, which is true, but it really means that if people are put in an environment that gives them the right kind of advice, they'll end up being happier. In other words, not immutable, this decision-making error. It can be corrected, but it needs regular support. Interesting thing was, uh, if they started paying people according to a higher score, they stopped cheating. That's exa exactly against what the economists would say, right? But it's an identity question, right? He says, this was just rounding up. I'm not going to cheat. And when it came to look like they were cheating because they were getting something out of it for themselves, they said, no, that's not me. But even more important was, people, there's a salience. Uh, you sort of, what do you sort of tell people and what kind of environment you put them in before they give them the test? If they asked them to m meditate on the Ten Commandments before they did the test, the cheating disappeared. <laughs> well, here's another one for you. One of my psychologist colleagues did an experiment on this. She had organized uh, students, and she gave some of them a certain amount of money, not a whole lot of money, $20 or something, and just gave it to them. Another group, she said, gave them this money, said, use this to make yourselves happy. And the third group, she said, use this money to spend some more time with your family and your friends. And then she interviewed them all the next morning. Guess the answer. Right? The, people, the only people who were systematically happier than the day before were the people who had been instructed to spend more time with family and friends. Now, the people who were given the money and told to make themselves happy should have been just as happy because they should have also gone out. They had the capacity to go out, spend the time with family and friends, but they didn't have the news to do it. <laughs> but give them the advice, and they do. Moral, when you're talking city structures, organizing ways in which people can have positive interactions with one another naturally then builds these kind of connections that support life satisfaction and support civility. When I gave some talk like this in the Maritimes and I asked somebody, what do you think if you see someone give you a traffic finger? And they said, ah, that'd be someone from out of town. <laughs> The social capital theme song, I can't tell you the background, but I promised somebody I'd have you try and sing it. Can you guess what it is? The more we get together, 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 more we get together, the happier we'll be. Because your friends are my friends, and my friends are your friends. The more we get together, the happier we'll be. <laughs> Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.